Now today, friends, we come to this 23rd Psalm. And as we come to this psalm, I want to repeat again what we said last time. And that is that Psalm 23, which is so popular, has been so wonderful, is meaningless without Psalm 22. And that leads me to say that we have a trilogy or a triptych here of three psalms that actually belong together. They are the shepherd psalms, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. Now, in Psalm 22, we saw the good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember, made the statement, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John 10, verse 11. And we saw that last time. Now, Psalm 23 is the great shepherd. And we are told the great shepherd of the sheep. And this is found in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 20. And this, of course, is that great benediction that is there at the end of Hebrews. And I'm sure many of you have heard it. And I know I've used it for years. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. That is complete in every work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, that's the great shepherd. And Psalm 23 reveals him as the great shepherd. Now we'll see next Psalm 24, and there he is the chief shepherd. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So that in Psalm 22, we see the cross. Psalm 23, the crook, the shepherd's crook. And Psalm 24, the crown, the king's crown. Psalm 22, he's the Savior. Psalm 23, he's the Satisfier. Psalm 24, he's the Sovereign. Psalm 22, he's the Foundation. Psalm 23, he's the Manifestation. Psalm 24, he is the Expectation. And in Psalm 22, he's dying. Psalm 23, he's living. Psalm 24, he's coming. Psalm 22 speaks of the past, Psalm 23 of the present, Psalm 24 of the future. And Psalm 22, he gives his life for the sheep. Psalm 23, he gives his love to the sheep. And Psalm 24, he gives his light when he shall appear. Now, we have, therefore, in these three very wonderful psalms, A picture. Now, let's zero in on Psalm 23. And it's very familiar. It's probably the most familiar passage that there is in the Word of God. No portion in writing of any kind, anywhere, has been so widely circulated as this. The Jew, both Orthodox and Reformed, knows this psalm. The Christian, Huguenot, Covenant of Vadois, Cromwell, Puritan, and all the denominations and all Christian groups acquainted with Psalm 23. And the world has caught its beauty. More is written on this. It's very short. It's very simple. Only six verses. It's like the Gettysburg Address as far as brevity is concerned. There are several very interesting little mottos that go along, I think, with this psalm. Someone has said, I do not care how much a man says if he says it in a few words. Well, you have a few words in Psalm 23. And then there is another. If folk who do not have anything to say would refrain from saying it, it'd be a better world. And that probably is true. And there was a business executive years ago that had this little motto up on the wall in his office for everyone to see that entered. It says, if you have anything important to say, 
say it in five minutes. Well, it'll take you just 45 seconds to read the 23rd Psalm. It is simple. It's not the language of philosophy. It's not the language of theology. It's not a legal or a scientific document. It is sublimely simple and simply sublime. And there are, I think, two things that we ought to know about this psalm before we look at the text. It's agreed that David is the author. But the question has always been, did he write it when he was a shepherd boy or an aged king? And candidly, friends, it's important to know that. Dr. Frank Morgan has called this the psalm of the old shepherd. I like that. I agree with it. David the king, you see, never forgot David the shepherd boy. And you have here not the musings of a green, inexperienced lad, but you have the mature deliberations of a ripe experience. You see, David, when he came close to the end of his life, he looked back upon his checkered career. He looked back upon his life, and it was then that he gave Psalm 23. And the old king on the throne remembered that shepherd boy and wrote this psalm. You see, life had beaten and battered and baffled and bludgeoned this man. He was a hardened soldier, a veteran who knew victory and privation and hardship. He knew song and shadow. He was tested and tried. And therefore, you have in this not the theorizings of immaturity, but you have the fruit and judgment born of a long life. And then here's something that is more vitally linked with the contents, I think, of the psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. But what authority do you say that? Is this a psalm for everybody, irrespective of individuals? I don't think so. I think that Psalm 22, 23, and 24 go together. And you have one story told here. And you have to know him as the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep before you can know him as the great shepherd today. You must know the shepherd of Psalm 22 before you can say Psalm 23. And now, let's look at this psalm. I have attempted to divide it, and you'll notice in my notes, you have, first of all, in the first two verses, a revelation of the sanctuary of the shepherd's soul. And verses 3 and 4, the record of the thoughts of the shepherd's mind. And then 5 and 6, the reflection of the happiness and hope of the shepherd's heart. 